So good day to everyone, wherever you're connecting from, whether it's early morning, afternoon, or evening. I would like to welcome you to the webinar on gender parity and an enabling environments focused on lactation and nursing spaces led by you and women. These services are part of the field um, specific enabling environments guidelines to support personnel in the field, increase representation of women, and accelerate efforts to reach gender parity. My name is Luis Diego Cobb. I work with the UN Development Coordination Office. And to make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible today, I'll start out giving a brief visual description of myself. I'm a Latinx person. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have short black hair. I'm wearing a white shirt. And I'm sitting in my home in New York City. I would like to start out also with some housekeeping items before we kick off. Uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. In the chat box. There are colleagues that will be attending that and we'll also be following up with a frequently asked questions document um, for any questions that we don't address and even the ones that we do so that you can have a additional resource for implementing the service. Towards the end of the session um, you can also raise your hand and ask a question directly and there will also be a chance to interact with questions and answers through Mentimeter and we'll have more details on that shortly. Mm. Also, at the end of the session, we'll have a short survey that we'll be posting the link in the chat box so that you can let us know how we did and how we can do better in the future. The webinar is being recorded and we'll be sharing the recording and additional resources after the webinar as well. There is captioning available, subtitling. So if you go to the three dots on your Zoom application, you can either hide or show some titles. So without further delay, I would like to introduce today's speakers. We have Ms. Katia Perlman, Senior Advisor and Focal Point for Women and UN Women. Mr. David Yavlek, Gender Parity Consultant. We have Ms. Elizabeth Chong, Gender Parity Consultant. And we also have in the background, Ms. Ana Belen Torres Camara, Administrative Associate. Ms. Shinobu Sasaki, Gender Parity Specialist. And we will also be hearing um, from two colleagues in the field, Ms. Sadia Haliru, Program Officer on FAO Nigeria, and Ms. Javiera Thais Cruz, Santa Cruz, Gender Advisor in UN Mission in Kosovo. As you may know, um, these webinar series are part of the High Impact Common Services. So in the next slide, um, you just see a, a filler slide, but basically what we're aiming is to make operations as sustainable and as impactful as possible. Traditionally, operations are seen as the background of programs, uh, but we believe and we strongly have seen more and more that they can also be leading and showing and setting the bar for sustainable operations and impact in the field. Um, the idea, um, in the next slide, you'll see one of the ideas of having these high impact common services is to be able, once we have the 131 bosses completed, we've been able to have a bird's eye view of which services are having the most impact and to facilitate and standardize that process so that it becomes easier not only to collaborate but also to increase the cost avoidances and efficiencies. We'd also like to improve the quality um, and also to standardize and to bring up leverage good practices from different entities in the case of today's service from you and women um, and strengthen um, the impact and the advancement of the 2030 agenda through sustainable operations. Um, we've divided the high impact common services in two main categories, and you'll see here in the next slide. I'm going really uh, quickly, as you may have seen in the annual review already, and you will see in the, in the slides and the resources. But the idea is to, to let the speakers um, share about today's service. Um, in general, the high impact common services on the left, you'll see here are the ones focused on cost avoidance. Um, these are the top 15 services, which have a savings of for cost avoidance of 380 million. And on the right, we see the services associated with social impact. So um, we've divided them and these are several of the categories. Some of them are focused on disability inclusion. There's a suite of those services from physical accessibility of premises, to inclusive HR. There's another area of innovation and efficiency. You may have seen some of the fleet management and booking that can be done digitally as well as clinical and medical booking. 
We have green and renewable energy in operations from electric vehicles to solar panels to solar home kits. And then we have gender responsive operations from gender responsive procurement. And I guess today's service fits into both gender responsive operations and also enabling environments. Um, and we'll have the colleagues um, dive deeper into this service and see how you can um, lead um, not only in parity, gender parity, but also in gender inclusion. So with that, I'll stop here and I'll hand it over to Katya, who will lead us into the details and specifics of implementation of this service. Over to you, Katya. Wonderful, thank you very much, Luis Diego, for your kind, kind introduction and inviting us here today. Now, following your um, great example of the brief visual description of ourselves, uh, let me just um, once more indicate my name is Skati Perman. Um, I am from a Nordic country and wearing a black jacket today. I have blonde hair and I'm joining you from New York City. Um, so we are all really looking forward to meet um, everyone uh, who has joined today. Now, our office at UN Women is mandated to enhance gender parity and create enabling working environments across the whole UN. And this takes place in support of the Secretary General's system-wide strategy on gender parity. So how do we do this? We lead and coordinate the network of over 450 gender focal points in the whole UN system. These gender focal points advocate for gender parity and the creation of enabling working environments within their respective UN entities and offices. So we lead and coordinate this very crucial network of what we call agent of change. We also provide technical um, advice, guidance and support to all UN entities such as through today's workshop. We partner with many entities and, for example, provide support with entity-specific gender parity action plans and monitoring mechanisms. So if you have any questions for us today or later, please do not hesitate to contact us. We are very pleased that we are uh, today joined by two members of our Gender Focal Point Network, um, Ms. Sadia Haleru of APO Nigeria and Ms. Javiera I. Santa Cruz of ANMIC. They will be sharing their good practice on the field-specific guidelines, which we will be focusing on at today's session. Perhaps we can uh, move to the next slide, please. Fantastic. As this is our first meeting with you, we would love to know where everyone is joining from, what your key role is within your UNCT, and your awareness level of the field-specific enabling environment guidelines. We have created a quick Mentimeter, in fact, uh, for this activity. So if you could please join us um, to have this poll uh, by going to www.menti.com and entering the code that you can see here on the slide, which is 54392127. I will in fact pass it to my colleagues, Liz and David, to facilitate this poll. Thank you very much, Katya. I think we already have uh, answers coming in where colleagues are joining us from today. This is very exciting to see from all over the world. So New Delhi, Abu Dhabi, Botswana, Hanoi, Cabo Verde, Rwanda, Vienna. New York. Gambia, Nairobi, we also have someone joining in the chat, we can see Kinshasa, Moldova, from all over the world. Maybe we can move to the next question soon.
so that we get to know you better, um, perhaps could you describe your main role in your UNCT in one or two words, please? So we have a, a medical officer joining us, gender mainstreaming, assurance, consultants, the common back office, facility management, staff counselor, a very broad range, this is great, procurement, HR, Common Service Associate, Recruitment and Admin, Agriculturist, very nice. Perhaps we can move to the last question for today's Multimeter. So we just want to know from, from everyone before we start uh, the webinar, uh, have you heard of the Enabling Environment Guidelines and Field-Specific Enabling Environment Guidelines? So a few people have, and uh, the majority hasn't. So it's great that you're all joining us today. Some people aren't sure. Yes, by the end of the session, all of you will have heard of the <laughs> Enabling Environment Guidelines. <laughs> so I'll probably close this poll now. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Elizabeth and David. Uh, should I continue? Okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's really helpful um, for us to know where you are located and what your roles are. Um, it was interesting to see such a really a broad range of uh, functions. So that's very, very interesting indeed. Also very important for us to see that the majority is not familiar with the guidelines as of yet, but as Liz said, you will be very soon because we will be offering you a walkthrough of the guidelines and really dive into some of the recommendations and good practice examples that are included in these guidelines. Now, we understand that the Secretary General has mandated all UNCTs to ensure compliance with a new iteration of the business operation strategy in order to deliver programs more effectively off the 2030 agenda. And of course, your role is of utmost importance in all of these efforts. Um, we will have a discussion after the presentation, but please, um, as um, was indicated also before, please don't feel free, uh, please feel free to use the chat uh, function all along and, and we will be looking at the chat and, and, and trying to react to your questions or comments as we uh, move along. Let's move on to the next uh, slide, please, and look at this, oh, here we are. Uh, actually, let's go back to the previous one. Great. Um, reaching parity, as you know, um, is a priority for the Secretary General. And just a few months ago, he reaffirmed his goal in his Our Common Agenda report. And for the SG, gender parity, uh, and to reach gender parity by 2028, is an urgent need, it's a moral duty, and an operational necessity. And this is why he launched his system-wide strategy on gender parity in 2017. He has also stressed that parity is not only about numbers, but also about changing the organizational culture. And in fact, if we don't change anything 
in our organizational culture and how we act and operate every day, we will not be able to attain or sustain gender parity. And also, this is why we are here today, to discuss how we can jointly enhance parity and create enabling working environments so that all personnel can thrive. And this is really key for all of us in the UN to reach our full potential. And through common services in UNCTs, we can make a great, great impact in improving the working environment for personnel in the field while boosting efficiencies and interagency collaboration. Now let us move to the next slide, please. Um, before we go through the guidelines, uh, let me just give you a very brief background on the issue. First of all, I would like to emphasize that gender parity is not a new issue. Here we can see that as early as 1970s, the UN specifically pushed for equal opportunities for women and men. Then in 1985, the first target was set on the representation of women. And at that time it was 30%. So how do we come to the gender parity and 50% uh, percent, uh, request? In 1995, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action set a goal of 50-50 gender balance. And this has been reiterated ever since by the UN member states, as well as the Secretary General. So it's not something nice to have, but a must have within the UN. And as you know, we are a good 20 years behind schedule. Let's, let us move on to the next slide, please. Our office developed the enabling environment guidelines and the supplementary guidance for the UN system in support of the Secretary General's strategy on gender parity. And um, these guidelines were launched by the SG in 2019. The guidelines provide concrete recommendations and examples of good practices on topics um, that you can see here, uh, such as workplace flexibility, family-friendly policies, standards of conduct, recruitment, talent management, as well as implementation. Um, we have supported the implementation of these guidelines through the Gender Focal Point Network um, and by hosting webinars on the guidelines for system-wide colleagues. Um, and let me just say that um, implementation of these guidelines and efforts to create enabling work environments was also mandated now in the recent General Assembly resolution for all entities, including at the UN country team level. Um, so if your UNCT could benefit from additional gender focal points, please let your leadership know and contact us for further information. We would be very happy to help. And my colleagues, I'm sure that we will, uh, they will share a reference to this General Assembly resolution that you can also use as a reference. Next slide, please. So let us talk uh, a little bit about the rationale uh, for the guidelines, uh, particularly the field-specific guidelines that we launched um, in March. First of all, the UN member states have requested the UN to take swift action to change the reality um, in the field and to reach parity. Secondly, the SG is very concerned about the lack of progress in the field. In his strategy, it was estimated that with the current pace of progress, it will take 703 years to achieve gender parity at the D2 level in peace operations. 703 years. So we need to take immediate action um, and, and really um, do our best um, to get away from these kind of numbers. Finally, Field-based colleagues have underlined um, to us the urgent need for the field-specific action and guidance. After all, the gender parity gap is greatest and the rate of change lowest in the field. And here you can see some numbers that illustrate this. 31% uh, of the UN Secretariat civilian staff in the field are women. And this is why these guidelines were created. The objective is to offer tailored recommendations and share the examples of good practice to attract, recruit, and retain women and improve organizational culture. Next slide, please. Very briefly, we started um, this endeavor of creating the field guidelines during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the most important uh, source of information and data were interviews that we conducted with nearly 200 colleagues from over 50 countries where the UN operates. 
including uh, regional directors, uh, peacekeeping missions, special political missions, uh, funds and programs, specialized agencies. We had a lot of um, uh, colleagues who are experts on, on different issues, um, uh, as well as then, of course, um, heads of missions, deputy heads of missions, gender focal points, etc. And you can see the geographical coverage here on the map. We also interviewed uh, experts on uh, gender, disability, and LGBTQI plus issues to strengthen an intersectional lens that is applied to all chapters of these guidelines. And we pursued um, a very collaborative and consultative approach to make sure that these recommendations are beneficial and realistic and can actually be implemented. So, but I want to really stress one point that everyone needs to be included in these efforts and everyone bears some form of responsibility. So let us now go over the topics of the guidelines. Elizabeth, over to you, please. Thank you, Katya. Um, so for everyone, um, a quick visual description of myself. My name is Elizabeth. I'm a gender parity consultant from UN Women. I'm a Chinese Canadian joining from New York today. I have long, dark brown hair and I'm wearing a blue button down shirt today. So let me go to the slide. The guidelines include six chapters, as you can see here. Within the guidelines, we offer a range of recommended actions from low hanging fruits, so to speak, and also quick wins. Um, we also have more structural policy level actions and changes. Each action can contribute towards building an organizational culture of awareness and understanding of gender equality, diversity, and inclusion within your UNCPs. So we will now really quickly go through each of these chapters and um, yes, next slide, please. So according to our interviews, improved professional and personal life integration was one of the key policy areas that would support women's recruitment and retention, and is therefore essential to the attractiveness of field postings. Of course, each duty station has a specific situation and no one size fits all solution exists. So it's important to tailor solutions for creating an enabling work environment that fits each context, duty station, and even job role. It is also important to note that this is not only about being family friendly, but also about providing support for all women, which includes single same-sex couples. We have numerous good examples from the system um, these are just two of them from the guidelines, and you can see many, many more within the guidelines. So here we see that in terms of parental leave, um, UN Women's Policy allows an additional eight weeks of pre-delivery parental leave with full pay in hardship D&E duty stations. Um, there's also the need for appropriate breastfeeding or lactation spaces, as well as childcare facilities in the field where feasible. For instance, UN House in Abuya, Nigeria, provides a crash and shares it with other UN agencies, while UNMIC's duty station has a dedicated lactation space. So these are the two examples that Sadia and Javiera will be diving into today. Next slide, please. The next chapter is standards of conduct. Based on our interviews, standards of conduct is also a key element to create an enabling work environment. It was underlined by many during our interviews that issues related to misconduct need to be made visible. As good practice examples, the CEB task force, the Chief Executive's Board Task Force on Addressing Sexual Harassment has developed a number of policies um, for system-wide application, um, including the code of conduct, which we shared in the chat at the beginning of our session. Next slide, please. Um, security and safety conditions also have important implications for gender parity. Duty stations that have high security risks or are perceived to be unsafe tend to experience recruitment or retention challenges, especially among women. One very concrete challenge mentioned by many was safety while commuting. So as an example of best practice, the UNCT in Papua New Guinea offers a daily shuttle for staff members, which especially supports women personnel. We are preparing this to be the topic of our next practice note. I will now hand it over to David to go through the remaining three chapters. Thank you, Liz. Uh, my name is David Gavlek. I am identifying as male. I'm currently wearing glasses, having black hair, and wearing a black jumper, and I'm joining also from New York today. 
The next chapter covered in the field guidelines is occupational safety, health, and well-being. We learned in the interviews that the availability and awareness around health and health support are key ingredients of an enabling environment in the field. One concrete issue was related to the availability of women's health care professionals. At least three missions, UNMIS, UNSOM, and UNSOS, have an on-site gynecologist. Awareness is also crucial. Particularly, it is important that UN personnel traveling on missions are aware of the health care options available for them. UN Women's West and Central Africa Regional Office provides personnel with duty of care arrangements and information packages on all aspects of physical and mental health. Next slide, please. Recruitment is the uh, gateway into the United Nations. Gender-sensitive recruitment and talent management maximizes the organization's ability to ac acquire and retain the best workforce, reflecting the organization's principles of diversity and equality. One key area of improvement relates to outreach. Vacancy announcements are the first communication with prospective candidates for the hiring office, and therefore it is very important to ensure it shows our values in gender sensitivity, diversity, and inclusion. An example from UN Women is the guidance for creating inclusive vacancy announcements, which we will share in the chat. Next slide, please. In the final chapter, we focus on leadership, accountability, and implementation. As many interviewees mentioned, on paper the plans are there, implementation is often the main challenge. Interviewers also identified that it is important for any policy and practice to be situationally and culturally aware. Leaders are expected to play a key role in making good judgments in each context to guide others. Leaders and managers indeed have a special responsibility and can set the right tone to bring tangible results. And we are glad to share that several good practice examples, which will hopefully inspire you to follow suit, are in these guidelines. Please share these good practice examples also with your regional coordinators. For example, at the request of the UNCT in Nairobi, UN Women's Regional Office for East and Southern Africa commissioned a study to review the representation of women and the organizational culture in their office. The re resident coordinator in Nigeria has explicitly encouraged all agency representatives to pay special attention to recruitment and onboarding procedures to ensure a fair, equal, and respectful working environment. Next slide, please. Another example of leadership in action is the Making Parity a Reality Advocacy video series. Last year, we released the series through articles on iSeq and also through various social media channels. Nearly 20 leaders from the field worked with our office to create video messages on the importance of gender parity and implementation of the field-specific enabling environment guidelines. Seen here are just some of the videos that are part of the series, including the resident coordinators from Jordan, Nigeria, and Indonesia. We will share the video links in the chat, and we encourage you to watch and share them amongst your network. Next slide, please. Now that we have briefly gone through all six chapters of the field-specific enabling environment guidelines, Let's discuss the implementation of one specific recommendation. It is a recommendation introduced in Chapter 1, Professional and Personal Life Integration, on establishing an on-site nursery or crash, and also designated spaces for breastfeeding and bottle feeding. The guidance that we've prepared on the implementation of this recommendation is based on the experience of colleagues who have set a leading example for other UN entities to follow. We detail key stakeholders and partnerships that are needed to secure leadership buy-in for the initiative, a sample implementation plan, approximative cost factors, a summary of potential constraints, and keys to a sustainable success. And as Katya mentioned, we are pleased to have with us today two experts who can speak more on the implementation of a crash and lactation space in their duty station. Next slide, please. So first, we'd like to introduce Sadia from FAO Nigeria to briefly share her experience in Nigeria with the establishment of a shared service for UN personnel for childcare. Over to you, Sadia. 
Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name is Sadia Haliru. I am a Nigerian. I'm wearing a red dress, Jenny from Abuja, Nigeria. I'm also a gender focal point with Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, FAO in Nigeria. We do have a crutch in the UN House Abuja, Nigeria, which is shared among UN entities in the same company. Thus, the crutch came about through the support of the resident coordinator's office to the UN gender thematic group. All agencies within the UN house contribute to the common service budget, which is used to maintain the crutch. Therefore, cost of the maintenance is shared and spread among the UN agencies in the building. We have about 19 UN agencies, entities in the UN house currently. The UN common services, the operational management team and the UN common team, that is the heads of agencies are the key players in terms of day-to-day -day administration, management and setup. Presently, the crate has five beds, one breastfeeding chair, a TV set, a table, and a split AC. It also has a side cupboard for toys and other items for the children. In view of the current um, capacity of workforce in the UN premises in Abuja due to COVID, um, we have an average of three children per day. Before COVID, we had maximum of five children with their caregivers. Female personnel are able to combine work with motherhood as breast feeding in the workplace facilitate performance and, um, and logistics. This has, this has resulted in retaining more women at work, knowing that their children are close by and safe. We are also aware that breastfeeding improves the health of both the mother and the child, as well as protecting the child from diseases and strengthening the bond between mother and child. If a child is healthy, of course, it affects the general well-being and, and performance of the mother why she's working. As a result of this, some of the lessons we have learned at the country office in Nigeria include colleagues, especially women, look forward to raising children while working for the UN organization. The conducive environment and comfort of the crutch in the UN office in Abuja encourage and build confidence of parents to bring in their words while at work. Also, in terms of safety and security, parents are willing and happy knowing that their children are safe and accessible. From the office, while they're on break, they can just quickly come down, breastfeed their children and go back to their offices. For the female colleagues, it provides easy access to breastfeed their children in line with the UN Secretary Secretariat policy on breastfeeding. The clinic in the UN house has also helped us here in Abuja as as a result of the proximity of the crash to the, to the UN clinic, which is in the office, the children are healthy and their well-being is guaranteed. And lastly, one of the lessons we have learned in Nigeria is that it ensures professional and family life integration, which is one of the six thematic areas of the field specific enabling environment guidelines. Given all this, we still have some challenges we are facing currently at the country office. For instance, lack of space for expansion. We also need more funding to support this expansion, as well as now the, with, um, with the current um, COVID-19, we can only accommodate three children. So we do hope that once COVID is over, we will, we will be able to revert to five children per day. Then given our experience from the Nigeria country office, we hope that other field offices will adopt our, our modalities and establish a crutch and lactation spaces for children. It has been good for us at the country office. We encourage others to do the same. That's for others that are yet to do that. And we, and we hope that at the end of the meeting, the objective would be achieved and we, look, we would look back to say that um, we did well by setting the right pace. Thank you. Over. Thank you so much, Sadia, for your insightful intervention. And uh, now we would like to give the floor to Javiera from UNMIC in Kosovo to share 
her duty station's experience in the creation of a lactation room for nursing colleagues. Um, thank you, David. Um, in advance to all apologies for my tone of voice, I have a bit of a cold. Um, so my name is Javier Atay Santa Cruz. I'm the gender advisor in UNMIC. I am currently wearing some shades of brown and beige, I guess. I have brown hair and I am from Latin America. Um, our experience with the lactation room has been successful, not only for all the benefits that Sadia mentioned regarding breastfeeding, um, but there are other uh, related benefits to this. Not only does the mother or father in this case get the chance to spend more time with their child and feel like they have the space to actually have this relationship, but it also generates commitment towards the organization. When the organization is tailoring to your needs and supporting you, you immediately feel more committed and more loyal to this organization. And I think starting with some steps also gives you the impression that this will continue. Um, in our case, how this worked was that uh, we had the enabling guidelines and I had the benefit of uh, working closely with our colleagues in UN Women who provided infinite and very good guidance. Um, so we created our own implementation plan in UNMIC and one of the uh, ideas or actions was to have this breastfeeding room. Two key things that make these things happen. The one first one and 90% of the whole issue is to have the leadership's buy-in and the leadership's effective commitment, not just say they're committed, but actually uh, walk the talk. So we had that, but we also had big support from the mission support side, which makes things happen. So I think getting the support of these two simultaneously um, facilitates the creation of these spaces. Um, we had resources in terms of having a space to do it um, because other things that uh, in, are included in this space, many were donated by staff members. So we basically have um, toys, a diaper changer station, a sofa, a table for staff to work on uh, if they wish so sanitizer, refrigerator. Um, anyone who is breastfeeding or has a small child can have access to this office, whether it is for the purposes of uh, nursing or if they prefer to work, um, if they need a space where they can also have their child to work while their child is, is there with them. Um, in our case, we are a 300 plus mission. We're in a family duty station and only one third of the mission staff is um, international. So this means that most of the local staff will prefer to either leave their children with um, their families. Use uh, the international office. She was using it and it was definitely something that helped her because she had no way of not being close to her child. She did not have the proper care to help her out. So she would actually bring her child to work in our office and then she would nurse her whenever the child needed uh, nursing. Um, I think the breastfeeding room is very important and it is one of the steps one can take. Um, but every little thing, and they're big things in the end, not little things, everything that is included in these guidelines actually really encourage uh, an increased participation of women in peacekeeping operations. Um, my case, as I said, is very special because we're a family duty station, but you can really see how creating these enabling environments makes a huge impact on the results. Um, and I will extend this a bit from the uh, breastfeeding room. We had uh, the, the leadership under which we designed this implementation plan. 
they were really committed um, beyond words. And during the tenure of our past SRSG, 50%, 54% of the people recruited were women. And we are currently, uh, and this will make um, Katya happy, although I'm sure she already knows, we have our two, the two posts are filled by women. Our ASG is a woman. And the leadership positions from P5 to ASG in total, 50% are women. Um, and I think this also encourages other women to join uh, these sort of uh, working environments. So um, I am happy to answer any questions about the breastfeeding room when the time for questions comes. But above all, the support and the buy-in of the leadership the capacity to understand what are the things that stimulate your leadership to take action on certain things is also very important. And I think in our case, the breastfeeding room was really a step that was followed by other initiatives. Um, in terms of use, we don't have that much use lately because we have been working from home most of the past two years. Um, but it will be interesting to see how now with the changes that have been happening since COVID, how this will reflect in terms of the use of the breastfeeding group. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Javiera, for, for your tips and uh, advice. And uh, if we could move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So before we open the floor for a Q&A, We'd like to uh, share one more communication product related to the field guidelines. And as mentioned earlier, these guidelines featured a, cell, a set of specific recommendations for three different groups who can drive change. Uh, so the organization itself, managers, and every one of us, so all personnel. These communication products that you can see here are with distilled recommendations for each group. And we warmly encourage you to check out these resources and to share them amongst your networks. And you can also find them on New York Women's website. And now I would like to uh, give the floor back to Luis Diego. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Just a few of the points of implementation, especially with the business operation strategy. You may know these already, but just to kind of emphasize, you will see this and other high impact common services highlighted on your boss online platform. So particularly now until March 31st that you're undergoing the boss annual review, um, you may select these and other services that um, you know, can drive impact um, through your operation strategy. There are guidance notes and documents for all the high impact common services. We already posted the practice note on enabling environments. So you can find those either on the UNSDG website, on the library and resources. You may also find them on the BOSS uh, online platform. So if you go to the BOSS library, they're under the BOSS guidance documents. And they're also on the UNSDG knowledge management portal. So no way to miss them. Um, in addition to these global webinars, we also have dedicated either re regional or country specific webinars. So if there is something that you feel wasn't addressed or you want that um, extra leadership support, like Javiera was saying, or anything, we can organize also with the experts a dedicated specific um, webinar on enabling environments or any other high impact common service. Um, and in some cases, we, we are offering seed and pilot implementation support. So from technical support, in some cases, financing support, so if you are having some difficulty with any implementation, do reach out to us um, and let us know if there's anything um, that we can do from our end. Um, we also have Samir Froten, who's the global lead um, of the business operation strategy here. And I'll um, ask him if he wants to give any words before we jump into the Q&A. Over to you, Samir. Thank you, Luis, Diego, uh, Katya, and colleagues for, uh, for this interesting webinar. Uh, this is what we have been promising to our colleagues in the field that we are soon going to come up with uh, enabling environment practice notes and examples. And uh, this has been uh, wonderful, basically, and, and I'm sure it's just the start of this engagement. 
colleagues, uh, as uh, Luis Tiago mentioned, the timing is perfect uh, for you to think about uh, the enabling the environment in your UN country team and uh, to consider this uh, collectively, jointly with the rest of the uh, UN entities under the boss. Uh, because, uh, as Katya mentioned, the enabling environment is the strategy that is cross-organization. Uh, it applies to all of the UN entities uh, in the system. And uh, all of us will need to ensure that we have enabling environment for, uh, for all aspects, be it uh, crashes, be it prayer rooms, be it uh, breastfeeding rooms and all. And these are the, the needs of each and every uh, entity or agency, as you would call it. So the, the opportunity is there for us to include this as part of the boss uh, in one go, so all agencies could benefit. And it's also, uh, it will also make sure that we have uh, better quality as well as cost effectiveness. So thank you for that. We will be including some of these common services. We'll tag them as high impact common services in the boss platform. So when you're uh, reviewing your uh, strategy, your, your operation strategy, you can see them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samir. With this, we'll start the Q&A session. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that we're gonna start out with, but we do encourage you to raise your hand. If you'd like to ask a question live, um, please don't be shy. I think this is a great opportunity to ask the experts directly and to really um, remove any barriers or any questions that you may have for the implementation of these services. Um, so the first question is from Usman Sahud. And it's asking that the facility accommodate five kids. I think this was when Sadia was speaking. Is it only for FAO or for all UN AFPs? If for all, then how do you manage requests for accommodating their kids? Can I go so on with this? Thank you. Ahead. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, the crutch accommodates five kids at the same time. We have enough space, we have five beds. So that is the limit we can have, five beds, five children, then they have, we have the toys for them. Then there's also a space where the caregivers can sit down and for the mothers to breastfeed. Everything has been provided, like I said, but during, because of COVID, we can only accommodate three for now. But once COVID is over, five children. And it is not only meant for FAO. The UN office in Abuja has 18 UN agencies, entities, FAO, UNDP, UNICEF, UNFPA, WMO, and so on and so forth. So the crutch is meant for all the UN agencies and the UN city. Like I said, the budget is shared among all the UN agencies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sadia. Anybody else want to comment on that question? Maybe I can. Great. Um, no, I just wanted to say I think this is a really a great initiative and example uh, by Sadia. And uh, I, I think it's very important to remember to start from somewhere. And if there's more, um, if there are more requests, if there's more need, um, that will be very clear once you start the process, right? So then you can, of course, accommodate and you can request more resources and all of that. But I, I think this is really, really fantastic um, initiative. So thanks so much, uh, Sadia. Thank you so much, Katya and Sadia. Um, there is another question on the chat um, by Choni. It's asking, we encourage female candidates to apply for positions. Do we give additional scores for being female candidates? As of now, just encouraging female candidates does not result in having females on board. Somehow the male being vocal gets most of the positions. So would anybody like to take that? If I may. Please do. Great, wonderful. Um, this is a very uh, good question and we get a lot of um, comments across the board on this because um, this is of course related to recruitment and this is related to uh, re different recruitment processes starting um, from the fact that you actually publicize 
the, the vacancy, right? So I think it's extremely important to look at how do you actually um, implement outreach to different networks? How do you reach the women you wish to? Um, according to the rules and regulations of the United Nations, you cannot give any additional scores to women or men to that matter, because that would de facto mean discrimination, but you can do a lot of other things. So starting from the vacancy announcements, the job opening, um, you will need to look what kind of language do you use? If you use, if nothing has changed for 20 or 30 years, which was um, a case, for instance, with one of the UN Secretariat departments um, that we have worked very closely with, um, they had not realized that it was very much looking for actually the male candidates based on the language which was used. Um, so we've spent quite a lot of time on, 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 on looking, how do you make the language a bit more attractive to women? Um, you also need to refer to, if you can, um, to the different areas which have been mentioned in the enabling environment guidelines, such as if you have flexible working arrangements in place, if you, what kind of family friendly policies do you have in place? You know, all of this. And by the way, this is not just beneficial for women, it's beneficial for all genders. So whatever your policies are, you should also include them um, in the vacancy note. But also there are different ways to attract women. Um, and you can, you know, not just that we encourage women to apply and all of that, which is also a good start, um, but there are different ways. And, and, and for instance, um, in Vienna, um, you know, DSS, which is uh, the Department of Safety and Security, very traditionally male dominated area, right? Um, so our colleagues in Vienna have done a lot of outreach events and this way they have really <laughs> turned around the numbers of women applying, which used to be very low, but through these events where they explain what they do um, and, and really outreach different networks uh, of women, they have managed to, to really increase the numbers in an incredible manner. So, look at the language uh, and we can share perhaps if we didn't share Elizabeth um, the, the uh, gender sensitive language so to say and, and what to do what not to do and what to use and what not to use and you can also uh, contact us that's one then outreach what kind of out the outreach do you do do you really um, reach um, the the audiences that you want to and if not then you have to look at the ways how to do it and again we are happy to think about this with you. Um, and then of course, you go to the recruitment uh, process in, in itself, you know, the panel. You have to also make sure that you just don't have, for instance, men in the recruitment panels. It makes a difference if you have a gender balance um, panel and also people from different geographical representations. So, you know, as, as balanced as possible, I would say. Um, and then, of course, you need to tackle the uh, unconscious or sometimes conscious biases in the recruitment processes. Um, and this is a, a completely different topic and, and, and very interesting one and, and would really demand more time for us to discuss. But these are a few issues that one needs to pay attention to uh, when, if, if we are very serious about recruiting more women to, to the organization. Thanks so much, Lois. Thank you, Katya. You know, you have your hand up. Would you like to uh, comment on this question? Um, yes, I would like to <clears throat> tap in into everything that Katya said. Um, in our case, there was another element. Um, in the uh, first gender, par in the guidelines, in the first guidelines, there was this idea of removing restrictions that existed on UNVs which meant that uh, UNVs, United Nations Volunteers, could not apply to a position without having a break. Um, when these uh, measures were actually lifted, um, what happened in our uh, mission was that many uh, women of very high potential, these are fantastic women, um, were given the chance, of course, to apply to these jobs directly. And due to their high skills and potentials, they were sort of promoted to those positions. The reason why I put this in the whole uh, hiring box, it's because UNVs are not considered staff. So you are actually hiring them 
as if they were external. So I think that was a very um, good idea because really you have impeccable material. You and V's are, I would say, the, the diamonds of the organization in a way. Um, so I think this was a very good uh, initiative that at least in our case, contributed to, to achieving more parity. Thank you. Thank you, Javiera. Sadia, did you want to also comment on this particular question? I see your hand is up. Yes, yes, please. Um, I just want to add, you know, um, to what Katya said, for us in FAO, we are striving to make the, uh, the recruitment process more inclusive for women through dissemination in our vacancy announcements to a wider audience to encourage qualified women because we have a lot of qualified women some of them they don't get to hear the information they don't know what to do so it's all about information so we encourage them the qualified women candidates to apply also the fao panel is gender balance and in a situation where we advertise in a situation where we don't have qualified women we re-advertise because we want women to be involved we know women are capable they are qualified and they are also equal to the task thank you so much thank you sadia so in the interest of time i'm going to bundle some other questions um, and i know we have one participant that has their hand up so before handing over the floor to to the participant um, there are some questions on um, some of the support, financial support. So one of them is how to request seed and pilot implementation support. And then the other one was on, do you have any experience with leveraging member state support, notably in the form of funding, voluntary contributions for enabling environment measures within UN entities? Um, so those are the two questions on funding. Um, then there is another question of what to do if you have more than, or I guess the, the first question, sorry, back up. How many child caregivers are assigned per child? And what do you do if there are more childs than the caregivers? So those two questions, and I'll open the floor for the participant to, to ask the third question and then address them all together. Alda, if you can go ahead, the floor is yours. Hi. Can you hear us, Alda? Yes. Can you hear me? We can barely hear Hello? you. At least on my end. Very faintly. Uh, and uh, now it's better? Now a lot better, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, my well, my question is, um, uh, we have already budgeted uh, for this um, breastfeeding space. Um, but I would like to know uh, all the steps, how can we uh, implement uh, this process? Be be because we have already the budget, but we need to implement it. Over. I'm guessing this question is for me. <laughs> um, thanks for your question, Alda. Uh, I can just give you our experience. For us, it was a very organic thing. So basically, we said, we have the idea of this, and we have a room, and we can make this happen. We addressed the leadership, and he said, OK, make it happen. Um, because it's a breastfeeding room, and you somehow have a checklist of the things you need. Um, and in many cases, your checklist will be provided by someone who has children. Um, you sort of make yourself an idea of what you need, and then you find a way to procure it. In our case, the fridge was already available um, in our warehouse. So we just moved it there. The couches, these are all, most of them are resources that the mission already has. So basically what you need there is a door 
someone who will actually get this done. Again, we were very fortunate because um, our chief mission support was very much a doer. Uh, so if you have someone, if you have the leadership giving a clear instruction to mission support, and you have someone in mission support who is really committed to this, it will happen in a day. Um, so I would say it, in, we didn't even need to go through any bureaucratic process. It's This is the decision, the resources are there. We already had them, not budgeted. They were just available. There was a room, there was a fridge, there was, um, we used uh, donations uh, from the, from the recreation committee, all things of the sort. If you want to make it happen, you just make it happen. And it would be sort of the, the philosophy of how we had it made. I don't know what your uh, context is and whether it is very bureaucratic, but to me, you just grab the people who make the decisions and make things happen and they will make it happen. So if you want, we can then have a conversation offline and I can walk you step-by-step step how we did it but I feel the context we are talking about may be perhaps very different. But just, you know, look for the doors. Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, I would like to have this bilateral talk with you. Absolutely, I'll put my email there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alda. Um, we'll open the floor for any of the other specialists if they want to address the other questions. I know one of them was addressed for the seed and pilot funding. So I have put in the contact that you can reach out to DCO. It's dco.cbs at un.org. I'll put it on the chat box again. And you can reach out to us to, uh, to see what your needs are and what is the available funding. And then I'll open the floor for the other two questions, one of them on leveraging member state support and the other one regarding the caregivers, how to assign caregivers um, to each one of the facilities. Over to you. Thanks so much. Um, perhaps I, I, I will address the member state support. Um, there definitely is, um, let me think how I will say this. There's definitely very strong support from the member states. Um, to achieve gender parity, as well as create enabling um, working environments. And we refer to this uh, recent uh, GA resolution, um, or actually two resolutions in this regard. And, and Elizabeth, can we make sure that we have included them in a chat, uh, the references, especially the one which was just adopted in um, December last year. So there is, it's, there's a very, very clear request from the member states um, in this regard. Uh, and also they refer to um, the importance of, of um, having gender focal points in all UN entities, as well as have um, necessary resources um, to do all of this work. Of course, they do not address how these resources will be um, established. Um, but this is then the question within each UN entity to discuss upon. Um, you know, how do we find the resources? What do we do? What are the human as well as financial resources um, in order to make this happen? Um, because this, and I think it's, it's okay that the member states do not micromanage us to that level either, but this needs to be discussed in each UN entity. How do we make sure that we can, you know, um, implement what the member states actually want? Uh, and how do we divide the resources uh, accordingly? And I think it's it's also a good idea uh, what was proposed, what I understood was proposed. Um, if you want to um, mobilize resources in this regard, fine. But I think the basic thing is because the member states have requested us as, as the UN to reach parity um, for a long time. So I think they expect us to deliver upon this mandate. And enabling environment is very much linked to the gender parity, because as I said, it's not just about numbers, it's about really making sure that we um, provide equal opportunities to everyone. So I think uh, the, the person who asked the question, I think uh, he or she is absolutely right that you might not get the additional resources, but you never know. Um, if you have good connections, 
with the member states and, and you can you have a very good initiative um, perhaps you know um, you find uh, uh, something which inspires you in the guidelines and you want to go ahead and do it and you need some more resources so um, you can also always of course approach the member states in your respective through your respective entities and and, and do that um, because I think what the member states really appreciate are very concrete concrete ideas um, um, because we've we've done a few projects as well but they have to be very concrete to the point um, and um, and you know we'll we'll need to have impact so uh, it's also possible of course I want to also comment what Javier said um, about um, the resources sometimes we we say that well we could do this or we could do that but you know we don't have the additional resources so we can't really do anything and a lot of these um measures a lot of these initiatives what we have listed in the guidelines actually they don't cost you anything it's just about the will to do it and and as Javier said you need to have a doer you know who will actually make all of these things happen so um in order to walk the talk so a lot of it doesn't need additional resources some of them yes and let's focus on those what we can do you know there are a lot of um, there are some of the points which we have made in the guidelines that would require policy change, you know, which would have to go to the fifth committee of the General Assembly. And this might be the most difficult way for you to start, so don't start from there. Make the point to your staff representatives that, okay, we do, I don't like this because this is, this is putting me in a, um, in, you know, this, this discriminates to um, a single mothers compared to, you know, between the national staff and the international staff. So make the point your, to your staff representatives, um, you know, that these issues are constantly raised, right? So that they can be discussed in the fifth committee or ACABQ or wherever it needs to be to make the policy change. But start from somewhere else at the same time, what you can do at this stage, which doesn't request a process through the General Assembly. So start wherever it's the easiest, what you, you know, and, and which you find inspiring because you, there are a lot you can do. So I just want to, you know, leave it for the positive, because um, indeed we are all needed to this, and we all can do something. Thanks so much. Thank you, Katya. Sadia, you had your hand raised. Would you like to comment on any of these questions? Yes, I would like to add to what Katya and the other uh, Javira said. Um, for us in Nigeria, the gender focal points are agents of change. And we are very vocal in the country at the country level. Whatever we say, the RC and other thematic group listen to us. We are vocal. And each of the UN agencies have a gender focal point that is coordinated by the RC's office. I am a gender focal point from FAO. All the UN agencies have gender focal point, which I said it is very vocal. And um Funding or I mean the resources was not an issue for us because they knew what they know what we are doing, where we are coming from, and it's for the benefit of everyone. If the mothers and all the parents are not happy, they will not be able to put in their best. Once you know that your child is safe and is just the you know is next door, you will do everything for the organization. So it was not an issue for us. And the crash in the UN house here in Abuja is being managed by the UN city, the operational management team, as well as the UN, uh, what do you call it, and the UN common services. The funding is shared among all the UN agencies. There are 18 of them. It is not an issue. It is not, oh, it is FAO or UN women or UNDP or UNICEF. Everybody contribute to the bigger posts so it is not an issue the administration the management and setup is handled by un city common services as well as operational management team because they know the importance and like i said it's part of the enabling environment guidelines but this has been there when we when we relocated from lagos we are here everybody is in this building and how do we move forward and it's based on our discussions in the gender thematic group that gave rise to this. This is where we are. 
And we're also looking at expansion, like I said, because we just have five beds. If you have six or 10 children, where do we put them? So if we're able to expand with the funding, we might even have maybe two or three more rooms or a bigger place to accommodate all the children. So I think it's for the benefit of everyone. Enabling environment guidelines is for everybody. It's not just for the ladies or for the men, it's for everybody. So as we can succeed in UN House. And like Katya said, it's for, if we want gender parity, we have to look at the enabling environment guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Sadia. We know we have a few questions that we still haven't addressed, but in the interest of time, we're going to follow up um, with a document addressing all the questions that we did address and the questions that we still have to address. Um, Katya, would you like to give some closing remarks before we close for today? Thank you so much. Um, not really closing remarks, but I, I just um, really want to thank everyone uh, for your kind attention and uh, active participation um, and uh, for those really excellent excellent questions and and um, you know asking for for advice as, as well and I think we have also made some connections between colleagues and and, and please again uh, do not hesitate to contact us directly or perhaps uh, Javier or Sa um, Sadia um, they have um, they are excellent gender focal points and they have a lot of experience and, and um, they have inspired so many um, on the ground. So they, they would be also happy to share their views. And again, you can find more examples of good practices and recommendations um, in the guidelines. So please do not hesitate to look at um, those more closely. Um, we hope that this has been useful for you um, and um, we would love to hear from you um, if you have some ideas, if you have some initiatives, how have you, um, how have you um, solved the issues? If you have any related to um, financing and um, resource mobilization, we would love to hear um, what kind of um, role the leadership has, has also taken from you. So please do keep us informed and we would um, also like to showcase your great examples um, uh, in the future. But thank you so much, uh, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, Luis Diego, uh, this was really great uh, dialogue and exchange and um, let's keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you to all the speakers, to all the participants. And yes, this is only a beginning. There are many steps and there's a lot of support available there. Uh, so please feel free to reach out and we'll follow up with the recording and the questions. So have a great day and thank you for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.